Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today was basically introduce you to our program and what we do and how it started, the Epic Challenge program, and then talk about a little bit about um, the recent challenge we're, we're, we're planning to roll out here in this coming week on the Epic, uh, on the uh, COVID-19 challenge, and then how we could potentially work together because I just um, was introduced to Debbie and this fantastic um, project and, and nonprofit that you're doing. And I think there's a lot of synergy. My good buddy, uh, Kevin McCann, introduced me to Debbie. And so I, I'm enjoying it. I'm already uh, chatting with some of you and, and interacting. And so um, let me see if, uh, if we go to the, the foundation is really, uh, the vision is really to transform the way we educate and to increase the number rate, quality, or ability of students um, entering professions in STEM-related or STEAM-related careers, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. Um, these are some of the things that, uh, why we think this, this will work, uh, why it's worked for us and what we see. Our mission is really to provide this virtual and physical ecosystem for students of all ages that basically helps to motivate them and connect them with subject matter experts and mentors like yourself all around the world. And, and the core ideology is really trying to transform education and um, um, make sure that everything we do offer and create is open and available for everyone for access to all students around the world. Um, the, one of the reasons for doing this and why I got involved in this uh, was because we're losing students out of the STEM pipeline. If you see this uh, figure from birth to uh, retirement, if you will, in the United States and really all around the world. And, and so um, we have all these great jobs that need to be filled, but we will not have students to fill them in a couple of critical areas. I work in aerospace, and so that's just one of many areas. We lose them uh, by the seventh grade. We lose about 80%, lose interest in STEM. And by the time we graduate K-16, we have only about 4.5% of, um, of the population that actually go into careers in STEM. Um, and I think I know why this is happening, or at least we're trying to solve that problem. Um, uh, if people on, online are gamers, uh, perhaps Adam is, maybe Joe, uh, I'm not. But what I learned was that uh, kids are getting addicted to gaming because they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And I think we have an opportunity here to um, engage these students and motivate them with the challenges we have. These are just some of the people we've worked with in the past. Uh, Mentor Project is one of our new acquisitions. We work with the Center for Space Education and the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. And it looks like we have a lot of funding, but we don't have any funding. But we, we're working with some great people and some great organizations. And um, the intent is to eventually uh, get some funding so we could do what we want to do. And so how uh, did I come about this in my career as an uh, aerospace engineer and as an astronaut? I was training in Russia when the Columbia accident happened. And uh, this is a picture of me studying at uh, Star City in Russia. And if you think our education system and pedagogy is old fashioned, uh, this is why I don't play polka. Uh, you can see everything is written on my face, right? It was, it was, they basically transmit, we memorize and spit it back down to them. And I, I believe that the way we uh, continue to teach and educate in the front of a classroom, this is what the uh, baby, uh, the millennials, this is how they look at us when we're trying to educate them. So I've been looking at online learning. So I was in um, Star City. Uh, we got the terrible news uh, the night of uh, February 1st in Star City that we lost the crew and we lost the Columbia vehicle. And then what I proceeded to see online, this was an area I worked in for many years in the thermal protection systems, and I could just not, not believe 
that the, the good engineers and project managers, when they saw this large piece of foam hitting that sensitive thermal protection system, they did not know this was going to be a problem. Um, and so uh, when asked uh, whether this was a problem or not, the people in the mission, uh, mission control and the mission management team said, no, it's not going to be a problem. You don't have to worry about it. And uh, this is just a view of the Columbia breaking up over almost directly over mission control, but it was in the, in the woodlands, um, the wooded areas of, uh, thank God, uh, of uh, north, north of Houston, Texas. And so these really good people um, made a terrible mistake. And NASA had to literally and figuratively pick up the pieces, 85,000 pieces scattered across Southeast Texas. Uh, we had to put those pieces together. This is a hangar at Kennedy Space Center. Um, and we had to understand, first off, did the foam really cause the problem? And uh, what we learned from the Columbia accident investigation was yes, Foam was probably the technical cause of the problem, but more importantly, the primary cause of the problem was really the people. Uh, the, the dysfunctionality of the culture, behaviors that we had, things like psychological, it was a psychologically unsafe environment. All these behaviors, which is why I'm glad that psychologists and psychiatrists on the line were critical in us not being able to understand that this was truly a critical problem and for us to make the wrong decisions. Then the uh, folks at Johnson Space Center had to understand, did the large piece of foam actually cause the accident? And so what they did was they designed a full-scale test setup with a large air gun, a nitrogen gun, pressurized large piece of foam and a large, um, section of a wing leading edge, a full scale section of an actual wing leading edge. This was a very expensive test. In, in my mind, it was a dumb test because originally how it was designed, uh, the folks did not plan on instrumenting it sufficiently. It was just gonna be very minimal instrumentation, six strain gauges. And if we ran the test, it would be very expensive, took a long time to develop the test. So we couldn't run a lot of them, we would really not be learning much from this test other than a large piece of foam might have caused a problem, right? We basically told the uh, Columbia Accident Investigation Board, told the program to slow down. Um, they allowed me to go um, outside um, to the NASA research centers and put together a small team of scientists to solve this problem. And really, we solve this problem just like all good scientists and engineers. And this is what we teach our students. Uh, when you see a, f a physical event, you, you go out there, you look at it, you try to understand it, you develop an analytical model, you conduct an experiment. And then you go back and forth between the analysis and experiment uh, boxes until your analysis and experiment correlate very well. And you conduct, you vary parameters and you test to failure. And when your analysis is actually able to predict failure, then you move into what we call optimization and design. Uh, you could vary lots of parameters and you could, you could basically model almost every, any configuration and, and conduct uh, an analytical analysis of what, that, uh, what will happen. But then you still go back and conduct experiments. So we teach our students the importance of this process, the rigor that's involved in this process. And we also teach them to fail intelligently, smart, fast, small, cheap, early and often. You just don't go out and design a full scale test because it's very expensive, but you have to capture that knowledge in the laboratory and validate your analysis. And we do this in a building block approach. So a good case study for how our students will, will follow and do this is basically uh, the way we approached it with the teams of researchers at NASA Glenn Research Center and NASA Langley Research Center. These great uh, structural mechanics and dynamics experts and material scientists basically look at ballistic impact of foam and then they model it using finite elements and a, a, a high-speed 
uh, analysis. This, in this case, they were using LS Dyna, and they and they validate that their models for predicting failure in that particular material are correlate with the experimental results that you see here. And then you move to the target material, which was the wing leading edge made out of reinforced carbon carbon. You're now shooting the uh, um, the small piece of foam. Uh, into a carbon-carbon specimen at varying speeds. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it doesn't. You're correlating your analysis with your experiment. And then you move to the point where you va validate your, your analysis, and now you use that analysis to actually model the experiment. So now, before they ever conducted the full-scale test, this was the simulation our engineers um, and researchers, how they predicted, what they predicted, what would happen, a large a rectangular size hole would form in the wing leading edge. This only took three months time to do. When people at Johnson Space Flight Center said this was impossible. When you have the right team of people together, you can do amazing things. And then they run the full scale test. Only now it's an intelligent test, right? And they conduct that test, but now, So you see that the analysis accurately predicted um, what happened in the experimental test, but now you have an analytical model that should we ever see debris hitting a wing leading edge, whether it's foam or other debris, we can model it and make those predictions on the ground while the crew is in orbit, instead of telling the crew there's not a problem. And remember, this could have been what the, what the actual damage was to that wing leading edge when the crew was in orbit and we told them, won't be a problem. You don't have to worry about it, if you can imagine that. So I was a little upset, right? And, and I started working on ways to solve problems and get our, our, our astronauts back up and flying as safely as possible. I did not know I was gonna be on the next flight. And so I was, um, busy working with these other teams. And one of the challenges we had to solve that I was working on was, the, the, um, was trying to repair damage. You know, if we send up the next crew and they have a pizza box size hole in the wing leading edge, how do we repair it? More importantly, what we learned was that you only need a thumbnail size chip from the coating of that carbon carbon material, which is very thin. It has a thin silicon carbide coating and the entire leading edge would disintegrate as you re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and it heats up. And so um, how do you repair this? We were watching, I was watching uh, large teams of uh, industry and government uh, folks at Boeing, Lockheed, NASA, Thiokol, try things and fail. And they couldn't solve this problem. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna use the Friends of Charlie network. I'm gonna have a small team of people. I'm gonna go into my buddy's garage, who is a fellow astronaut, Don Pettit on the left there. The other two gentlemen, one of them was the head of Stennis uh, 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 Space Center. The other one was the head of um, a Glenn Research Center. And we're gonna try things and we're gonna fail. And we're gonna try things and we're fail, gonna fail and we're gonna learn, but we're gonna try many things in order to come up with a solution to how we um, fix or repair this wing leading edge. So in my friend's garage and Don Pettit's garage, uh, these are objects that the Friends of Charlie Network sent to us. As we were coming up with ideas, they would fabricate them to, for us. They would send them to us and Don Pettit and I would test them using very simplistic types of tests. Here we were using just an acetylene torch, right? But this is where I got the idea for the Epic Challenge Program and the Epic Education Foundation. Because these teams were failing because they really didn't understand the physics of the problem. And very early on, I pulled in a good friend of mine who happens to be a world expert in aerothermodynamics, Peter Nafo and had him run his own code that he developed in order to determine what was causing this, these high temperatures along the wing leading edge 
uh, along the edge of this repair patch that you see here, right? And so once we understood what was causing that, we could design solutions. And that's what you see on the right-hand side. We, me and Don Pettit basically uh -huh. developed a doubly curved shell that astronauts could go outside. They could um, 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 bolt down to the outside of the wing leading edge, and it would conform to all different curvatures of that wing. So once we determined that that idea could work, we handed it off to a, an industry team and a slightly larger team of researchers, and they did all the final calculations and analysis in order to certify that, hey, we could do this in space and it would, um, and it would work, okay? So why was I able to do this? And I'm, I'm writing a book on high performing teams and, and how do you form these teams and these networks of teams? to solve these problems. I believe we were, a, we were able to be successful because 22 years of my life I spent as a researcher in thermal structures area at NASA Langley Research Center. And these are some of the different systems and subsystems that we worked on. Thermal protection systems, hot structures, cryogenic tanks. And so you see in this dash curve, the people in my branch had expertise in multiple different domains. They were materials experts, they were structures experts, they understood heat transfer, they understood vehicle dynamics. And we worked very closely, almost in a converged way, in how we analyzed these different systems, whether they were cryogenic tank systems or thermal protection systems. These were cryogenic experts in multiple different areas to understand these systems. And we would test these systems to failure so that our analyses that we were developing were validated by real, by real experiments and experiments to failure. Working like that in a converged way, it was very easy for me to reach out to people around the country that I had worked with in other programs like the NAS National Aerospace Plane Program, all these really huge hypersonics programs with all the top experts in the country that were working in, in these areas. That's, how, that's why we were able to do what other teams were struggling with. Even though they had really good thermal and heat transfer experts and structural mechanics experts, they didn't have this close relationship um, and, and, and almost like a convergence of different disciplines to really understand these types of problems. And oh, by the way, if you have questions, just jump in, okay? And so we were able to, to do things in my friend's garage, like develop tools to drill and tap through the wing leading edge so that we could develop fasteners uh, made out of this exotic material that we could uh, screw into uh, the wing leading edge. And we even came up with uh, a way for actually producing a large flexible uh, sheet of this material that we could stretch over and cover up that large pizza box size hole. So that's where the whole idea for the um, Epic Challenge program came from because I thought wouldn't it have been great to have students all over the world tap into a real Epic Challenge just like we have the COVID-19 challenge. And we could have enlisted the help of any expert in the world to help us solve this challenge. But more importantly, wouldn't it be fun for students around the world to apply what they're learning to help solve a real challenge? So uh, that's where we came up with the idea. Um, uh, I felt that NASA had some great challenges to work. A lot of the challenges we've worked on, most of them have all been re related to space. Um, we're looking at using online learning and the latest tools um, to teach problem-based experiential learning. We're teaming up with people from Finland. And so we're looking at using phenomenon-based learning. And we're teaching our students to think critically. When they see a problem, don't assume that the expert you're listening to knows everything. Basically, learn it for yourself. Test those hypotheses out for yourself. Um, and so the methodology we developed to do this, uh, I won't uh, 
I won't belabor this, but we, we basically immerse the students in the problem. We teach them how to work together on teams. We teach them how to communicate. We provide them with tools for them to learn how to think outside the box, how to be individually, how to be creative, how to work creatively uh, with their team so that their collective creativity is, uh, is enhanced. And then we teach them how to rapidly uh, develop ideas and then evaluate those, those ideas, but what we are calling rapid concept development. And we teach this to engineers um, and we teach it to our students how to go about doing this, how to fail smart, fast, small, cheap, early and often. And this is important, not just for students in high school and undergraduate students. Most companies fail because they lock in on an idea way too soon in the product development cycle. The, and there's what we call the concept development phase. So if we can teach students how to do this, hopefully they'll grow up to be engineers who do a better job. We started teaching this program in 2008 to young NASA engineers. Uh, that was our first class. We had 30 engineers from seven different NASA, NASA centers. We put together this Innovative Conceptual Engineering Design, or ICED, methodology, together with researchers from Penn State, Georgia Tech, MIT. We immersed these NASA engineers with a problem. We selected a problem that NASA couldn't solve. It was the land landing of a capsule. NASA has been spending over 50 years trying to develop a space capsule that lands on land and not in the water. And um, we, we had a workshop for the students at um, the NASA uh, engineers at Penn State. We had them there for one week. We used their learning factory. We immersed them in the problem. We taught them uh, the methodology and, and things like um, um, biologically inspired design. Then we turned them loose in the learning factory to, to um, prototype their ideas, to test their ideas. And after that workshop, we selected only one of those ideas, a personal lab bag shown here. And we had one graduate student, an MIT student from Penn, from M, um, an MIT master's degree student. And we had about eight undergraduate students from Penn State and MIT. And they worked um, not full time, but you know, uh, um, part time with Sidney Doe, and they actually solved the problem that NASA couldn't solve. They came up with an airbag system that would be located inside the capsule, and it, uh, they did a series of over 45 full-scale drop tests and to validate that their idea would work, and it not only worked, but it saved mass and it saved volume on orbit. So this proved that the methodology to me could work and we could use this open innovation uh, by reaching out to thousands of students around the world to help solve these problems. So I've been working on this for the past 10 years. Um, I believe that once you have those students like Sydney Doe, uh, they provide the mentorship at the graduate level all the way down um, to the middle school level. So the creativity, what we want to do, which is different than a lot of other nonprofits, is we want to link all these levels of education together because we think that's important to help stem the tide of us uh, losing students from the STEM pipeline. Creativity typically flows up from our youngest students, but the mentorship Sydney Doe, as a master's degree student, helped to mentor undergraduate students. We could use those undergraduate students and community college students to help us mentor and educate the high school educators and high school students. And, and so uh, we've been doing this in the United States. Um, and so since 2008, we've been running it. I've been doing it all along the East Coast because that's where I'm located. Um, and this just is when I was at NYU for two years, we had um, over 40 high schools in the New York, New Jersey area. I even uh, taught this to young uh, faculty at NYU, uh, looking at uh, biomed uh, sensors for spacesuits. Uh, we taught it at Stevens Institute, and uh, we've been to uh, Penn State, Georgia Tech, and MIT. 
and it's it's been continuing ever since. Uh, we've moved to Finland. We have we started in Joensuu, Finland, uh, with only four institutions. Uh, we've moved to Lakti and and Tampere, and uh, and we started with only 20, 23 students uh, the first year in Finland. Now we have over five hundred students in Finland. And in Finland, we, we use phenomenon-based learning. And the students here, as you see, we had students that were graduate students and also mixed in with undergraduate school students and high school students. This is, was really a, a unique experience. So we've been experimenting with different modalities of this um, experience and different pedagogies around the world. Uh, we're also working with learning scientists at Boeing that have what I believe to be one of the best capstone programs in aerospace engineering, where they're linking seven to 10 different universities to, uh, together. They have formed teams of 10 teams to seven teams of uh, university students mixed with students from different universities. We developed a collaborative platform to basically teach this online. So we're experimenting with it online. And we're also capturing the data. As the students move through two semesters of a product development cycle to build an unmanned aerial vehicle, you can imagine uh, seven different teams. This was in um, uh, 2019, 2018, 2019 timeframe. Students are actually, in their senior year, have all the knowledge they need to build an airplane. Right, but here we have experts from Boeing and academia instructing them on how to use their knowledge to work together in a team to design. Different um, team members have different roles. They might specialize in aerodynamics or structures or systems engineering. And this is basically showing how these students are interacting with the content and with each other. So um, using the platform we developed last year in Valamis, we can now understand how these forms evolve over time during this uh, product development life cycle. And now we could actually look at the communication between the team members and the interaction of those team members with content. So now we could start understanding how these students are learning peer-to-peer -peer learning, social learning, uh, learning from mentors, and we can start personalized learning. And so if um, you're familiar with Sandy Petlin's work at um, the at media, media Lab at MIT, uh, he wrote a uh, paper called, he, uh, his book, Social Physics, uh, is, is a good book. Um, and he wrote a paper called The, Sci the, the, Sci the New Science of Teams, we're basically you're looking at what it takes to have a converged group of experts in multiple different fields. Now look at how a team is performing and how that team is behaving, right? So now we're trying to use this uh, um, expertise to try to understand how these teams as students are performing. And if you just look at three very simple parameters like energy engagement and exploration, energy is uh, the number of interactions of the students in, in um, email or on Twitter or on um, Facebook or how many posts they do. Engagement is how well the team is engaged, uh, the distribution of that energy, is it equal amongst team members and exploration. Are those teams able to look outside that team and pull in outside expertise? If we were able to actually analyze how the NASA team performed on the ground when they were trying to understand the Columbia accident, there was no exploration. These people thought they understood the problem. They did not reach out to other subject matter experts. And so it was that echo chamber of people that thought they understood the problem that really didn't understand the problem. And that's why they failed. So um, if we look at one of those, uh, two of those teams, we did some analysis on last year's teams and we noticed that team three um, looked much better than all the other, the other six teams. 
with respect to energy engagement and exploration. And then we actually, we actually did a fly off and I don't have the video. I didn't show the video, but this team actually shown it did an outstanding job. And I would say they, they excelled over the other teams. Um, as far as the vehicle and their vehicle that they designed and how well it performed. Are there any questions right now? Do you know why that one team uh, excelled over the other teams? Well, you see this team, it was highly engaged. It had a lot of energy. They were very engaged and we, they were also exploring. So this team, without diving into and analyzing their communication with using natural language processing and, and how they made decisions, but that's what we're going to be doing in the future. Just by using those three simplistic parameters, if you were to, um, uh, if you were to uh, handicap which team was going to be this, the winner, you would have picked this team. I didn't even dive in there and look at their an analysis that they were doing. I did not look at what their design just looked at this raw data and these three very simplistic parameters and and it worked but what i would recommend is that we could do much better than this right this was just the tip of the iceberg and so now what i'd like to propose that we work on together as a team is taking these ideas and looking at a new challenge that isn't an aerospace challenge um, it's a totally uh, outside my field of expertise. And so we're going to prove that this methodology will work. And we're starting to use, um, and so this is the new challenge that we're going to be, we're going to be rolling out at the beginning of next week called Pandemic Proof Society. It was, it was, uh, it came to me when I was teaching the Epic Challenge program um, and this COVID-19 uh, turned up and I'm saying I'm teaching this course online. Wouldn't it be great to just create a new challenge, teach it totally online, create the curriculum online in real time and link students around the world with subject matter experts to not only learn about this pandemic, because I think just that knowledge alone is very helpful, but now let's link together with subject matter experts and try to see if we could Look at some sub problems related to this challenge and can we form student teams to help come up with innovative ideas for solving this problem. So um, um, uh, one of our educators who couldn't make it online, James Gorman, is putting together a curriculum for high school students. We're going to also or bi-weekly lectures by subject matter experts. We will be creating the content for these students at a university level and a high school level, right? And this is just an announcement that I did online. I'm going to be posting it and I'll send you a copy of it, uh, Debbie, and you guys can advertise. Uh, advertise for the program. What we do is we functionally decompose the problem. And this is just, we use uh, concept maps. And this is what, um, just a, a very simple comp concept map that um, James Gorman, uh, one of our high school physics teachers put together. And what we're doing is, and I could use our, our help, and this is one of the things I talked to um, you about, Debbie, is I could use the help of the mentor project in all of these key areas, like the medical area, business area, um, how we could identify in each of these, what I'm calling um, communities of practice, if you will, in each of these key areas, do we have experts that can help in epidemiology? I can help out and pull in lots of folks for the Friends of Charlie Network for the engineering, uh, the science and engineering part. Uh, but And I'm also reaching out to some of the astronauts, for instance, that um, um, like Lee Morin and um, on my team uh, to help us create um, uh, communities where we could start creating content and develop curriculum for the students to dive into um, learning about COVID, for instance. And so some of the first lectures we're going to have, we're going to be immersing the students in the phenomenon, the medical uh, aspects of the coronavirus. And so we'll be creating lectures. We'll be we'll be linking uh, those students to um, um, material. Just like uh, remember, I think it was Loretta 
uh, at, at one of the last meetings was helping to create one of those spreadsheets with some links where diving in and, 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 um, and creating that content. And so what we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna develop these communities of practice, if you will. And in each of these communities of practice, we're gonna be linking and uploading content. Um, we're gonna be asking the mentors and our educators and subject matter experts to help curate that content. And when you see each of these little, um, each of these concepts, think of them as a community of practice where we will be connecting students to converse and interact with subject matter experts using Slack channels. Um, they will be uploading content. They will be accessing content online that we will be storing in, um, in folders, in Google Drive folders. So we could start putting, building folders and, and embedding them in these, um, in these different concepts, for instance. And then we're gonna teach the students how we want them to communicate, how we want them to interact with the subject matter experts. And so if you go back, Debbie, and, and, and team at um, the Mentor Project, if you look at these colored concepts, you know, these were just some ideas of challenges that we might have teams of students working on. And, and one of these could have been like one of the projects that Avi Rabinovich uh, just talked to the Mentor Project about yesterday, right? Imagine if now we have a project where students are looking at voice recognition and we could be linking with other subject matter experts from the Friends of Charlie Network, the Mentor Project, on how we can actually um, spread that idea of, of using Avi's uh, research and getting people to use it and almost like in a citizen science way to create um, data that he could use on that project. So we're gonna be, uh, these are some, in my mind, these are some of the ways we could work together that I just um, kicked around right before this meeting, Debbie. Um, you know, our students are gonna need mentors and subject matter experts. And so if we can connect them with folks in the mentor project, folks from other universities um, that we have contact with, um, if you can help us in curating some of the content as we're uploading it. Um, other things are is that uh, your mentors uh, in your project, if you have ideas that we can help create challenges for the students and kind of get them to sign up for, uh, this is a great time to do that. And uh, now I'm just going to leave it open uh, for discussion. 